Hello, everyone. We will be starting shortly. Uh, we're just waiting for everyone to connect. This is Timofey Milovanov. Thank you. All right, Timothy Brig is here, and we'll have General Petraeus in a second. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry for waiting. I was in touch with General Petraus now. We will sort uh, some minor issues with the links and we'll start shortly. Uh, he has some, um, you know, tough schedule. So it means that we will have to um, stop the conversation earlier as well. But I think we will have enough of time to discuss the most important matters. Thank you for waiting. And I'll make a short introduction uh, once he's here.
General Petraus, uh, we apologize for technical inconveniences and thank you for being with us. We also understand that uh, you have some uh, tough schedule, so we'll try to organize it quickly now, the conversation. Okay. I, will, I will introduce you briefly. Uh, I will introduce the moderator and then we will um, start. Sounds good. Thank you again. Okay, well, thank you all for waiting and thank you for watching us online. My name is Timothy Brick. I work at Kyiv School of Economics and we broadcast from Ukraine. I stay in my apartment here in the uh, center of Kyiv. Uh, if you watch us from Ukraine, please be careful, follow the alarms and follow to shelters if necessary. Uh, your safety is priority. You can always watch it on YouTube. Um, this is the 12th day of the Russian invasion to Ukraine. The whole world is watching. And we want to remind that Russia has attacked not only our civilians, army, um, government. They also attacked knowledge, science, and culture. Museums are bombed. Universities are bombed. Our colleagues now are fighting in the territorial defense. And we want to show to the world that Ukrainian science and education uh, stand strong with our nation and our army. We are resilient, we are operational, and we keep rolling with events and lectures. So we started this uh, series of lectures called Global Minds for Ukraine. We will keep doing it uh, maybe three times per week, so please follow us. But today, specifically, we are honored and privileged to have a special guest. Uh, David Howell Petraus, he is a retired army general who was appointed to, uh, to head multinational forces in Iraq in 2007 and who later served as a commander of US and NATO forces in Afghanistan in 2010. He later was a director of the Central Intelligence Agency in 2011-12. Uh, the conversation will be moderated by Timofey Milovanov. He is a former minister of economy of Ukraine he currently is an advisor to the presidential administration, and he is not only the president of Kyiv School of Economics, he's also a professor at Pittsburgh University. Um, so, uh, General Petraus, this is a privilege and honor. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, Timofey Milovanov will follow, and then in the end, we will ask some of our students to, um, you know, to ask a couple of questions to you as well. So, thank you. And pleasure, enjoy the pleasure to be with Global Minds. Thank you very much. And perhaps what you left off the very brief CV, thanks for being brief, uh, was that actually I'm a, I've been a professor at a number of different universities over the year, and it's great to be with this uh, group perhaps as Professor Petraeus rather than retired General Petraeus. Thank you, Professor. Uh, All right, um, let me move on. Uh, I'm going to call you Professor, OK? <laughs> That'd be great. So yeah, I love it. It's actually, you know, it gives us some sense of normalcy. And as we discussed it, the war is fought on so many fronts. So thank you for being with us. Uh, and here's the first question. Do you think realistically the invasion could have been avoided? More specifically, talking about the past one, two years, were there any sanctions or diplomatic tools or something else apart from you know, military action to prevent this? Well, you added a very important word in there that makes the answer to this pretty easy. Uh, and that word is realistically. Uh, and you know, were there some diplomatic initiatives that could have been advance that might have prevented the invasion? Sure. Um, you know, you could have surrendered. You could have said, we'll be Finland. We will never join NATO. But again, that was not realistic. Uh, on the other hand, the United States uh, and other countries could have advanced more of the very aggressive sanctions that have now been agreed. But again, they weren't realistic uh, because frankly, until Ukraine was invaded by Russia, uh, without provocation, very aggressively, very brutally. Before that happened, um, many of the major countries that were needed to make the sanctions successful uh, were not willing to sign up with them. And then, of course, the minute the invasion started, you see a real revolution in what is going on in European security affairs in particular, but also around the world. Um, I was at the Munich Security Conference uh, already. That was before, the day before it ended, the day before the invasion began. We already saw a degree of unity 
at that conference that I had not seen since I was a young major and a speechwriter for the Supreme Allied Commander Europe uh, in the days of the Cold War. Uh, ever after that, uh, there was always uh, a, a degree of, to which NATO was in search of a new mission, uh, a new reason to live, if you will, uh, raison d'etre. Um, and frankly, Vladimir Putin has provided that. Uh, he already was the greatest gift to NATO since the end of the Cold War, but then with the, ingre the, the aggressive, uh, unprovoked uh, invasion, um, this sense of unity just took on a whole uh, new uh, color, if you will, a whole new intensity. Uh, and you saw, again, Germany, for example, I think is the most striking example of this. Before the invasion, of course, Germany was reluctant to discuss uh, halting work on uh, Nord Stream 2. Uh, immediately, it did announced that the certification was put on hold. And then in the first weekend uh, of the war, you saw Germany commit three almost unthinkable uh, commitments. Uh, the first was $110 million, billion dollars in additional spending on defense as a one-time supplemental. That's almost twice the annual defense budget. Second, uh, you saw a commitment to jump immediately to 2% of GDP uh, on defense uh, by Germany, and again, unthinkable prior to the invasion. They weren't even at 1.5%. Um, and then third, the commitment to provide lethal supplies, uh, weapons uh, to Ukraine, when earlier, as you'll recall, all they've been willing to provide was essentially uh, Kevlar helmets. That's just exemplary of what has happened. And now you've seen this massive uh, amount of sanctions. Uh, and really, you're seeing a decoupling um, of the major firms, major companies yeah. of the world uh, from the Russian economy. Uh, it is breathtaking, really, to see what has happened. No credit card companies, none of the major ones are left. You're seeing now very serious. I think we'll see an announcement uh, today, if we haven't already, about um, sanctions on Russian oil. Uh, that requires a lot of uh, other work around the world, and it may include the United States um, having to relax the sanctions on Venezuela, trying to get to an agreement with Iran, a few other initiatives to increase production uh, of oil from countries that uh, otherwise would have been restricted uh, in order to put massive restrictions on Russia, uh, which of course exports some six or seven uh, million barrels a day. This is the single biggest step that can be taken uh, against the Russian economy overall, because it's the crude oil sales that are the biggest uh, element of uh, its revenue generation. Uh, natural gas, something a bit later down the road, perhaps, uh, noting that you know there's still some winter weather to get through in Europe, uh, and they need to be sensible about what is done. But again, you said, do you think realistically, and as I said, realistically, there was not anything I don't think more that could have been done than was done. Um, and then once the invasion took place, and then when we saw increasingly the horrific uh, nature of what is being done, the indiscriminate use of violence, uh, complete rejection of the norms of uh, land warfare, the Geneva Convention, um, the kinds of rules of engagement that we work very hard uh, to adhere to when I was privileged to be the commander, uh, three different commands in Iraq, at US Central Command for the whole region, and also, as you noted, Afghanistan. We made mistakes, and mistakes are made in war, but these are not mistakes. These are deliberate acts of terror. These are deliberate acts. These are, are criminal activities. Um, and uh, of course, there is now an enormous effort to document these activities for the International Criminal Court. And I'll just end by noting that in one of my assignments as a one-star general when I was in Bosnia, one of the tasks that I helped oversee was in fact the detention of war criminals uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina and also work with uh, Serbian authorities on that uh, and then sending them to The Hague. Um, and, and so again, until the invasion took place, so many of these actions were literally just unthinkable and then literally within days, a week, uh, all of a sudden you see, again, these massive actions being taken, which are going to have an extraordinary impact uh, on the Russian economy. You know, you would say it's going to push them into depression, except as you know, depression, there's a, 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 
a duration uh, that is part of the definition that will take you know a number of quarters to meet. But certainly, they're going to be thrust immediately into a very substantial recession uh, with a cut of at least 10% in GDP immediately. Um, and then enormous challenges as they try to redeem their debt. And again, they did enter the this crisis in a pretty substantial pretty solid fiscal respect. Their debt to GDP is much under 20%, uh, which is quite enviable from a number of perspectives, including that in my home country. Um, but they've lost access to over half of the international reserves that they had that they were going to draw on uh, to cushion the blow. So um, again, massive steps, not possible, not realistic, again, to come back to that word uh, prior to the invasion, uh, but now you're seeing all of this uh, taken very, very swiftly and really quite aggressively. Thank you. You actually, yeah, you covered it um, quite extensively, and I agree with you that, uh, you know, on the one hand, there is some construction of reality in Putin's world and, uh, you know, false reality in many ways. Then there is Ukraine which would not have surrendered, you know, or nope. given up. Yeah, yep. yeah. not realistic. Yep, and shouldn't have. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, obviously our behavior shows that, and we demonstrated why. Mm -hmm. We're a different nation, we're different people, and we're free. Uh, and that's, it's, that's important for us, maybe our main, main value. Uh, and you're correct, I think, we understand that in Ukraine, that... Uh, the West has not been united. And Russia, of course, um, kind of constructed that or engineered that, uh, a lot of yeah. multiple conflict of interests. But, you know, he's a, he's a great mobilizer, Putin. You know, every day, I've seen that in Ukraine, every time he does something, he mobilizes Ukraine. And we just get stronger and stronger. And now he's doing it to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So, But then I want to look at it from a different perspective. A lot of people discuss the plan of Putin. You know, whether it's working or not, whether it's great genius strategic plan or not, what were miscalculations. Uh, we want to ask, uh, in your opinion, maybe an unusual question. Did Ukraine have a plan? In your view, how does it look from your perspective? Does well, it very much so. Yeah, no, I, look, is... I think you can't improvise as rapidly as Ukraine has done. Uh, and it's a very, very impressive plan. Now, I should note, I have an advantage over other folks because I was in Ukraine not, not that long before the COVID uh, shutdown. And I had the privilege of going to the Donbass. I was in Kiev, Kharkiv, and then we drove to uh, the headquarters for the Donbass and then actually to the front lines in Donbass. So I had a considerable sense of the just the sheer tough, toughness uh, of the Ukrainian soldiers, uh, the determination of Ukrainian leaders. I met with the general staff and the uh, Minister of Defense and so forth. Uh, the government had just been uh, established at that point in time. And again, I was hugely impressed. Now, I recognize the limitations in terms of equipment and weapon systems and aircraft and all the rest of that. Uh, but the truth is that can be provided. You can't provide heart. You can't provide will, determination, fortitude. Um, and I recognized all of that there and realized if they can get the additional javelins, the additional stingers, the additional whatever it may be, this is going to be a very, very formidable military. And then of course, in more recent months, uh, we've learned about the establishment of the partisan forces and that is hugely impressive uh, because now you see the determination of individuals uh, who are giving up their weekends to learn how to contribute to the defense of their country. And then you see what I think can only be termed the, the Ukrainian resistance, which is as good as, if not better than, the French resistance, noting that, of course, you still have an advantage with the Ukrainian resistance because they're operating from Ukrainian-controlled soil, whereas the French were operating from Nazi-controlled soil. Um, but what is going on there, I find hugely impressive as well. But when I look at what was the plan, you know, what are the examples of this? Well, eventually bridges were, were taken down outside Ukraine, outside Kyiv. Um, the rail, all the rail connections into Ukraine have been destroyed. 
that is hugely important because the Russian military structure is built on an assumption that it will have access to the rail network. That's the backbone of its logistics, not trucks the way, say, our system or helicopters, heavy helicopters or, or wide body jets in our case. We have a military that is truly expeditionary. The Russians clearly do not. In fact, I looked at the force structure of the Russian of a Russian unit relative to ours when it comes to logistics, and it is vastly inadequate. Again, I know something about logistics. I was privileged to command uh, the 101st Airborne Division during the invasion of Iraq. It was about 20,000 soldiers when we added all the additional elements to it. Um, I mean, this is an organization that had 254 helicopters. We used 500,000 gallons of fuel just in the first refueling point, about 150 or 200 miles into the country. And then we established another, that's the first two weeks. And then really the middle week two and three, so it overlapped another 500,000 from the next refueling position, which is about 250 miles into the country. Think of the sheer number of 5,000 gallon tankers that that requires and all the other uh, elements of that, generators, hoses, nozzles, uh, pumps, uh, bulldozers to berm it up because we had to do it in the middle of the desert, you put huge bags in. The logistics are incredible for that. We knew how to do that. The Russians clearly do not. Not only that, they lack movement control cells, it's very clear. Um, again, if you only have roads on which to move, and that is the case because the ground hasn't frozen uh, the way the Russians might have hoped, uh, so you're road bound, especially for wheeled vehicles, um, then you've got to have control of that movement. And if you don't, then it becomes chaos. And that really is what is the situation north of Kiev in particular, where there's this very well-known celebrated 40 mile traffic jam, essentially. Uh, and oh, by the way, the more they sit there and they run the engines to, to stay warm, of course, it uses more fuel and the further behind the Russians get in terms of refueling. And now they can't even get the vehicles through to refuel. And of course, the, the, the resistance expertly is targeting the fuel trucks in particular. Um, and, and that is, again, genius. Uh, you don't go after the tanks or the armored vehicles. It's hard to destroy those as well, unless you have javelins. And then they're following up with actually either partisan or regular military who are using the Dutch anti-tank systems and now gradually the javelins. I mean, the resupply has been staggering. Uh, 17,000 javelins, as I understand it, in the last week alone. Uh, a dozen planes, wide body cargo jets, about half of those are from the United States, are landing every 24 hours uh, at a location just to the west of uh, Lviv and uh, then being ferried into the country at a feverish pace so that you can get it all in before the lines of communication start to get cut. Um, and so again, I, I think there was a huge overestimation of what the Russians would be capable of doing. Uh, but the truth is that's based on them, you know, against enemies that their ground forces weren't necessarily fighting, say in Syria. And of course, what they ultimately did in each of these cases is they essentially destroy uh, a city or a location such as Aleppo in Syria, they depopulate is really the the, the term for it, um, and they eventually destroyed it. They did the same, as you well know, to, to Grozny uh, over a number of years in the wars in Chechnya. Um, and again, I think individuals underestimated um, Ukraine, the plan it had, especially when it was delayed in implementation, because I think understandably President Zelensky didn't want to scare the population or give Russia provocation by mobilizing until 24 hours before what turned out to be the invasion. Um, and so your defenses initially were behind because you couldn't put in all the obstacle belts and all the other uh, fortifications and everything else. But then you've had enormous amount of time since then, relatively speaking, in, in, in military terms, you know, many days to establish these defenses, to thicken them, to fortify them, to position weapon systems to make good use of snipers. You've killed three senior Russian commanders, including a general officer. And by the way, the reason those individuals were killed is most likely because the Russian army lacks initiative. Uh, it doesn't have small unit leadership that 
that it actually will take initiative that will you know we had a term that in 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 iraq for example during the surge that in the absence of orders figure out what they should have been and execute aggressively russians don't do that ukrainians clearly do um, and you put all of this together the ukrainian conventional forces and special forces who are very very good as well uh, the partisan units and then the resistance you know, and the resistance is jamming the frequencies of the Russians. Turns out they don't have frequency hopping radios. They're not even always secure. Um, you are removing road signs, something that was done in France during the resistance as well. And you either point them the other way or you put something else on it, like welcome to hell or something like that. Um, all of these actions, again, are very, very impressive. And the sheer determination uh, of your country and, of course, of your president uh, is inspiring the rest of the world to support Ukraine, noting that there are limits, clear limits, uh, beyond which uh, the US and other countries are not going to be willing to go um, for, I think, legitimate reasons, although they can certainly be, be argued. Thank you. So a related question. Do you think US underestimated Ukraine? Again, I... I'd like to think that I did not, but obviously there are a lot of observers who did, who were surprised. You know, you may recall in the very beginning, I said, this is, you know, don't, don't overestimate what the Russians are going to do at, at, at Kyiv. By the way, keep in mind as well that Kyiv is larger in just sheer surface terms than New York City. New York City is a little over 300 square miles. Kyiv is over 320 square miles. So it's a vast, vast area. You have very few skyscrapers. Again, I've been to Kyiv, Kharkiv, Donbass, Crimea even, uh, the year before it was uh, seized, uh, Lviv, and, and over a number of years. And by the way, the very first time I should acknowledge was uh, during the, the final year of the Soviet Union. Um, so again, a lot of familiarity there. And, and again, there's an awful lot that about just sheer heart. Um, you know, Clausewitz and others have all noted the importance of, again, you know, the moral is to the physical as three is to one. And I think it's more than that in this situation, because this is urban combat at the end of the day. And urban combat is exceedingly difficult. It is very soldier intensive. I did the math very early on, and I said that there's no way that Russia will be able to successfully to occupy the, the whole country. They may, may not even be able to occupy Keith, now they will destroy a lot of it tragically um, in a horrific way. And they are indeed doing a lot of that right now. Um, but again, I, I saw something in the Ukrainian soldiers, their leaders and so forth um, three years or so ago when I was there that really was quite, quite heartening, quite inspirational. Uh, and again, you can't teach that, you can't impart that, you can't develop it to, I mean, you can improve on it, but it's either there or it's not. And then, of course, what has happened with the invasion has galvanized this unbelievable um, level of resistance by Ukrainian forces. I mean, the fact is that I, I, you can verify this, but I don't think that Ukrainian support for the government six months ago was universal. Um, I think there were a lot of questions about it. Uh, we, I mean, again, we follow this very, very carefully. You know, was there going to be more work in anti-corruption? What about the judicial system? What about, you know, this and that? Um, and I think all of those questions have gone away. This is about um, the homeland. And of course, that's one other huge factor. You are fighting for your survival, for your freedom, for your homeland. You are fighting on home soil you have the home field advantage as we say in athletics and you know that field really well obviously the russians do not and it turns out that the russian soldiers don't have their heart in this um they have questions about it they weren't even alerted to the fact they were actually going to go into combat until in some cases the day before some weren't even sure where they were why they're attacking a, a country with which they share such a common heritage often other uh, aspects of, of uh, of, of their social makeup and so forth. Um, and so again, I'd like to think that 
some of us recognize this. I know that uh, Ambassador Herbst did as well at the Atlantic Council. There are others that have ex real deep experience, much deeper than I have with uh, Ukraine and its people and its military. But I think it doesn't take a huge amount of time. You know, I was there for a number of days and it doesn't take a huge amount of time to get a sense of how, how durable, how um, tough, again, to come back to that word, uh, Ukrainian soldiers uh, can be, and they are, and so are the people and the leadership. Thank you. So one question is uh, from the Ukrainian audience. We're interested to learn about how NATO and West, you know, the US, British, the EU decision-making works. Uh, is this more about political elites? Is it about public pressure? How they interact? Is it about bureaucracy? Uh, how is it? How come that the sanctions? As you, we slightly touched on this in the first question, uh, sanctions were implemented originally, almost impossible, but suddenly they could be implemented so quickly. Um, you know why no fly zone is impossible. So just we understand the structure and engineering of this, so that we have a better feel of what's possible, what's not. That's important for us also to know. Sure. Yep. Let me. So the the decision making body of NATO is the North Atlantic Council. And that actually is constructed of the heads of government of the 30 NATO countries. Um, and that is, that's really the decision-making body. Now you have what are called the permanent representatives of these countries, uh, the North Atlantic uh, Council representatives at uh, NATO headquarters in Brussels. And on a number of issues, they can actually resolve the issues with guidance from their capital. And then you have the NATO military committee, which provides the military advice to the uh, ambassadors and ultimately to the heads of government. When it starts to move very rapidly, this can actually move quickly. In other times, it can be very, very slow. Uh, it can be maddeningly slow. I, I and I speak from a degree of experience, I was a four-star NATO commander, also a U.S. once four-star commander in, a, in Afghanistan, dual-hatted, as we say. I was a three-star NATO commander and three-star U.S. in Iraq. The four-star position in Iraq, I was strictly U.S.-led coalition. And I was a one-star NATO uh, officer in Bosnia, again, with a U.S. hat uh, that was doing the war criminal hunt and then counterterrorism. Um, but again, I've been to the North Atlantic. My father-in-law was actually the NATO military representative back in the Cold War days and all the way back to when I was a speechwriter for the NATO commander and even uh, a lieutenant. I was, we were part of the NATO uh, Allied Command Europe uh, land uh, mobile force. Um, and again, sometimes it can move quickly and we've seen that. But that's a rare, that's normally the exception rather than the rule. Normally, it can be quite time consuming. The, there will be, however, uh, there will be red lines, if you will. And I think the red line that has emerged and become, if you will, more bright red, in part because of Putin rattling the nuclear saber, uh, is the uh, resistance, unwillingness to get into a direct say US uh, Russian confrontation or NATO Russia confrontation. Now I should point out that in many respects, the US obviously has to be the foundation militarily for any significant action of NATO. Uh, the US doesn't just spend more than all of its 29 NATO allies together, it spends more than twice as much as all of them. And then so you have the US up here, then you have say the UK and France down here and then in Italy, maybe Germany a little bit, and then sort of everybody else. If you don't have the country that's up here as the foundation, as the leader, as the base piece, you literally can't have the others. And, and the European leaders don't like this, it's, but of course they're not, they don't have the means to, even if they spend 2% of GDP or more, uh, it nowhere will close that gap. That's just a reality. And so when the US decided to withdraw from Afghanistan, a decision that I, criticized and also the lack of adequate consultation in European terms, at least. Um, the Europeans, although they wanted to stay in Afghanistan, could not stay without the United States. So I would just point out how significant US leadership, US actions and everything else are. That does not mean 
however, that other countries cannot have a very significant role. I would credit the United Kingdom for being the first to fly C-17 wide-body cargo aircraft into Ukraine uh, with anti-tank weapons. I think it was three or four days before the U.S. actually got to that, although we'd provided them before. Uh, but this is a new augmentation. Um, again, you see the very significant action uh, by, by Germany. So individual countries' actions can, in a sense, they, as we say in the military, they're walking point for the rest of the alliance. They're out ahead of the rest of the alliance, and the rest of the alliance watches, sees what they see, what happens in response, and then join that. Normally, again, it is the U.S. that is doing that, uh, but it, but a number of uh, the other countries can have a very significant role. And right now, the other reality is that the new frontline countries, if you will, um, the Baltic states, uh, Poland, uh, Romania. Uh, Hungary uh, and Slovakia, uh, in particular, are of increased importance. Arguably, Turkey is uh, as well when it comes to the Strait and so forth into the Black Sea. So that's sort of how NATO operates. Um, and here you have also overlap with the EU, um, with some additions and some exceptions, the UK being one of those now. That's also very significant. Uh, and if the EU as a body decides to take an issue in action in financial or economic terms overall, that can be very, very substantial because uh, it is you know, very nearly in aggregate, it is the, the similar to the size I'd say of probably China in aggregate, not the US, especially with the loss of the UK. Uh, but again, very, very significant. Uh, and so once again, you put all of these together, and then don't even forget, you know, don't forget Japan and other major players around the world. Um, the all of this comes together, and what uh, the leadership of the U.S. and others are trying to do, working together, is to orchestrate all of this going forward. The, again, the latest will be, I think, uh, some form of sanctions on Russia's export of crude oil. Thank you. We thank you very much for this. We're now going to go to our students of the Kiev School of Economics who will ask uh, the question. We perhaps uh, start with, yeah, just raise your hands. Um, Irina, would you, be, would you be okay? Yeah. 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 My greetings yes. to everyone. Thank you so much, Professor, for your comments and your answers. Um, I also have a question. It's very simple and very short, but at the same time, it's extremely complicated, and I haven't found any answer to that yet. Uh, from the very beginning of its uh, unjustified invasion of Ukraine, the Russian Federation has been systematically carrying out military attacks, including airstrikes on res residential housing, civilian buildings, hospital kindergarten, schools, even cultural monuments, religious institutions, and other non-military civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. And I'm 22 now, and I'm wondering how many years of my life I will observe these indigenous things going on in Ukraine right now. Well, that is a pretty profound uh, question and, and one that I'm not surprised you've not been able to find an answer to so far, Irina. Um, and here I would fall back having actually taught economics uh, once uh, along with other subjects. You can never go wrong by answering a question beginning by saying it depends. And in this case, it does depend, obviously. And so, you know, I'd have to erect a variety of assumptions, which is, of course, how economics is built in the first place. Um, not all of them, of course, completely valid. Lots of Nobel Prizes have been won, showing that the consumer actually is not always rational, doesn't always have perfect information, et cetera, et cetera. But um, in this case, it does depend. Um, how long um, can Putin, how long can Russia uh, continue doing what it's doing uh, and sustaining the kinds of economic sanctions. Again, these are really unprecedented. And what's most unprecedented about this is that this is not, uh, again, Iran, which already had somewhat insulated itself 
Um, this is a country that is completely integrated uh, into the global economy. Uh, and decoupling, as is taking place, of major businesses, major uh, streams of revenue and so forth for Russia, this is going to be enormously damaging. I mean, at the end of the day, the quality of life of the average Russian is going to suffer uh, very considerably. And again, I think you can expect to see more and more and more individual uh, issues, sanctions, initiatives taken just to tighten further and further and further. More banks uh, cut off from SWIFT, more, uh, you know, the, figure out how to clamp down in the rest of the reserves. And then what will some of the other countries that are really important in this case, and here I'd single out, for example, India, China, and some others, how will they react to sanctions, as we've discussed a bit uh, on crude oil and so forth? Um, so again, there's, there is no answer to this. I guess you could make a variety of different assumptions that would have to be pretty elaborate and then try to extrapolate from that. But I, don't, I just don't see how one can do that. Um, and, you know, I, I think the world very much appreciates the extraordinary circumstances in which you find yourself. I mean, it, I have been, obviously I spent, I don't know, six or seven of my final 10 years in uniform deployed in war, in combat. Um, and so I have a sense of what it is like for a population to experience what your experience, except that what your experience is, is vastly, vastly worse. It is indiscriminate. Um, it's, it's capricious even, you know, no one knows what will be struck next. There's no logic to this, there's no reason. Um, and so again, I very much appreciate it. And even though I've seen again, war-torn societies and bridges blown all over a country and electrical towers, I've never seen anything remotely like what is being done uh, to your country and particularly to the cities that are the focus um, of these Russian criminal activities, atrocities uh, right now. Um, you know, it, it is gratuitous to say that we all admire the spirit. Um, I, I just admire the fact that you are trying to continue normal life. Um, I do appreciate that. Again, I, we used to go to lengths to try to just do something that was somewhat normal in combat zones. Um, you know, their soldiers would glow, grow flowers at a base or they would adopt a dog. They just want anything that can sort of occupy them a bit with normality rather than what goes on, uh, obviously, in a country at war. Um, and so, again, I, I have deep admiration for what you are doing th this call alone. Uh, and by the way, I'm willing to go, uh, you know, five or so minutes at least over the time uh, because of the challenges that we had hooking up in the beginning. Um, so again, I, you know, on the one hand, we can say we, we appreciate, we understand, we, but we really don't, we can't. No one can appreciate that unless they're in your shoes. And those are very, very difficult shoes right now. Thank you so much for your, I, I don't know, empathy for, opinion yeah thank you um all right i think we have uh um ah, uh Nin Yuan, yeah uh, i think yeah please hi thank you so much for answering our questions and i have a few questions the first one is just to mention my hometown is Kharkiv, which has been heavily attacked since day one and I have many friends, my family was there and up until recently. And it's just very dangerous to be there right now. And it's very difficult for people because some of our friends said that they can't even bear it anymore to just hear the shelling, the explosions, and the sounds of jet fighters. And yeah, some of them left because they just couldn't stay there. Some people still still are there, and their like first question is that why can't NATO close the sky? Like why? Do, how many people like should die for 
other countries to do something because sanctions okay yeah but uh, people are still dying like why is it happening first of all let me just offer something to you that may be a little bit i don't know illuminating or something but you know i i used to be asked um what is it like to receive news of casualties when you're a leader um and i used to say that you know we're all different we are all some have a bit more resilience perhaps but what i did say is that news of casualties of hardship of horrific attacks and so forth that never gets easier and we're a little bit like a like a vessel um, and there are holes in the bottom and the holes are a different shape for different people but horrible news horrible experiences loss tragedy uh, casualties and so forth are poured in the top and they only drain so fast and the vessel can overflow and that's what's happening to individuals in ukraine there are some people whose vessels are overflowing and i understand that completely and they just cannot stay they cannot continue to experience the horrors that russia is inflicting on ukraine any longer or on specific areas where they live work um, or try to survive and again i think we all have we have to understand that um that's that is just a reality. There are some others who have seemed to be able to take a bit more of the bad news um, than others and to remain tough. But you never know when that actually happens. And so one of the tasks of a senior leader, what I sought to do was to try to identify uh, in those with whom we were working, our counterparts, and indeed with those I was privileged to lead, the subordinate commanders and and soldiers and so forth, entire units sometimes in aggregate, if their vessel was overflowing. And what we had to do in those cases where that was the was obvious was literally to move them. Um, we had to read, we would call it redoing the battlefield geometry, but it actually meant getting a unit out of a place that was so tough, say in Eastern Baghdad, where they could no longer take the losses that, that were being inflicted on them. I would go to multiple uh memorial ceremonies for for the loss of four or five six soldiers at a time and you just recognize that and that is a bit uh, maybe the the only way i can describe what it is that civilians as well as military there will be experiencing um you ask again why can't we close the skies and you know as i alluded to earlier there just are going to be limits to what NATO is willing to do. And here, I should note that this is where the rest of the alliance matters, because even if the US was willing to do this, and I don't think we are, I'm not obviously sitting in the situation room table of the West Wing of the White House, but I sense that there is a real serious reservation about, again, getting into a direct air-to-air -air confrontation or on the ground with Russia that could then spiral even worse, even more horrific uh, than what we see, keeping in mind that we this is not like past small conflicts um, or, or, or large conflicts. This is in a nuclear age. Um, and with someone who's reasoning, we have doubts about that we're really questioning. Uh, you know, how could an individual do what he is directing his forces to do? To fellow human beings and to a neighboring country again unprovoked but if you think through what would be required to do this you'd have to operate from an airfield in a country nearby you could actually fracture that very very important and precious unity that nato is experiencing again the most incredible unity uh, of at any time since the cold war you could fracture that by saying, okay, look, we want to fly from your airfield. Um, and they say, well, uh, you know, thanks, but I'm not, not, not willing to allow you to do that. And then you can literally start to, to achieve what Putin is trying to do or was trying to do, which was to fracture the alliance, uh, to drive wedges between countries that might be a, a bit closer to Russia than the rest of the alliance, 
to fracture Europe from North America and so forth. But the real issue here is, again, are we going to risk World War III, to put it in very simple and overly simplistic terms, um, to, again, it, keep the, uh, the skies clear? And you know what has been done instead of that, uh, as you will well know, is to provide very capable man portable air defense systems, um, and also they're examining other uh, options when it comes to air defense systems and early warning and radar and so forth. Uh, but these have inflicted very considerable loss on Russian forces already. Just on Sunday alone, I think it was, um, or Saturday, I'm sorry, I think there were four or five Russian aircraft knocked down. That's more than we lost in, I don't know, maybe I wouldn't say the entire 20 years in Iraq, but it's certainly more than we lost in the years that I was privileged to be a commander there. Um, I think that Russia is losing more soldiers, perhaps already, um, again, just at day 12, than we lost in 20 years uh, in, in Iraq. It's very difficult, obviously, to get an accounting. Russia doesn't share this information the way that we did. It doesn't have metrics and charts and all the rest. It doesn't have a Congress that it has to report to. Um, but that's the essence of this particular issue. Um, and, and again, we all fully understand and appreciate why President Zelensky and the Minister of Foreign Affairs and, and others and, and you all would publicly call for this. But there are going to be limits to what, again, NATO can and will do, although they've very much, I think, already pushed the limits quite considerably. They've expanded, you know, they're press pushing the envelope, as they say, uh, already on a host of different issues. And one of those could be the transfer of uh, MiG-29s from Poland to Ukraine, because uh, that's an aircraft that, that your pilots can, can fly, uh, and then replacing those with US uh, frontline fighters in, in Poland. Thank you. Um, we have one more question from Marianne, and then if there is time for Q&A, we'll do Q&A. If not, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll move on. Okay. Marianne. Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you for participation. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I am student of Kyiv School of Economics, and with the beginning of this war, I left Kyiv, where I, I used to live. Uh, so now, currently, I live in the western part of Ukraine. Uh, the, my question is the following. How can the war end successfully was for us? So what does it mean for Ukraine to win this war? What will be an indicator of our victory after which a peace treaty can be signed? In other words, uh, under what conditions can Russia admit its defeat? Should we rely on the military expulsion of Russians from Ukraine? or wait for some kind of coup d'etat or Russia's economic collapse. Additionally, additionally, in this context, probably we are too optimistic if we believe that at the end of the war, Crimea and Donbass will be completely under the control of Ukraine. What do, what do you think from, realistic, from the realistic point of view? Well, there's a variety of ways the war war could end. Um, obviously, you mentioned one of them, that there could be some kind of uprising in, in, in Russia itself. Um, Russia is being very, very harsh on demonstrators right now, as you will know. Uh, they are in the process of essentially decoupling themselves from the, the World Wide Web. It's the only way they can cut out YouTube. Uh, other social media have already uh, either left or restricted uh, what it is that they're doing. Um, major news networks uh, are leaving. So um, I think it's, it's hard to see how this kind of popular uh, resistance or uprising or disapproval would result uh, in, again, replacement. There could be something within some element of the regime that just says no more. I mean, you've destroyed our country, our economy, our way of life, our linkage to the rest of the world. We don't want to be the evil empire. 
so that is certainly uh, again a possibility. But again, I don't think any of these are uh, realistic to expect in the near term. Um, over time, I think as perhaps the Russians take such considerable losses, continue to take losses, um, literally run out of troops. Um, you know, they are now seeking uh, forces from Syria who have experience in urban fighting. Um, they will bring in, they'll recruit individuals from wherever they can, I'm sure. Uh, Chechens are going to go in. I don't think the Belarusians are keen to do this, but again, they might be pressed to go in. But the truth is that none of them are all that good. Um, and you can't expect them to be particularly proficient in the face of what is really a very, very impressive, again, uh, Ukrainian defense um, with, you know, the population mobilized. I, I have mentioned that, you know, I cannot imagine having invaded a country again as a two-star general. Um, I can't imagine invading a country where everyone hates you and most of the adult population is trying to kill you in addition to the military forces and perhaps paramilitary uh, that are present. It's just inconceivable. I mean, I cannot imagine how anyone could, could um, succeed in this kind of environment other than, again, just the wanton kind of uh, destruction and depopulation uh, of cities that put up the most determined resistance. And of course, Kyiv is the most significant of those because of course it's where the government is and, and objective number one of President Putin is to replace the Zelensky government with one that is pro-Russian. Uh, although it, it appears that that is gonna be much more difficult to do uh, than perhaps they thought at the outset, much, much more difficult. Um, you know, You can postulate that at a certain point in time Putin starts to look for a way out, that he might be amenable to some kind of uh, negotiated settlement. And th the truth is, I don't think we should want to see him in a corner with no options left, um, because in his maniacal state of mind, um, and given his willingness to undertake brutal activities, think of the sanctioning of the assassinations of uh, Skripal and uh, Navalny and others, um, this is a man who is very, very vicious uh, and doesn't shrink from that kind of uh, activity. Again, so how do, you, how do you come up with something that could be somewhat acceptable to him uh, to give him a way out, um, but then also might be acceptable to the Ukrainian government? By the way, I think a lot of people overlook the, the paramount importance of the Ukrainian government. Um, they think that the U.S. can go negotiate with Russia. And yes, he wants to hear from the U.S. He wants to be treated like, you know, again, a, 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 the Soviet Union used to be treated. His whole objective, of course, is to make Russia great again. But what he's actually done is make NATO great again and, and also unify Ukraine in a way that was just inconceivable uh, just certainly six months ago, if not three months ago. Um, could the Ukraine, so again, it's inconceivable that the US is gonna negotiate or that some other third party, you know, India, China, um, there are others that have relationships with Putin. I mean, you bring Chancellor Merkel out of retirement, let's say, um, but what is it that she would take to, to Moscow that could possibly uh, be acceptable both to Moscow and acceptable, of course, to Kyiv? Um, and, and again, I think rightly, Kiev is not going to, uh, again, surrender. It's not going to, uh, it, even if there was a, a willingness to do that, it's just, it's, it's both physical and political suicide uh, to consider some of the ideas that have been put forth. So again, I fear that this is going to be a, a, a long, very hard, uh, horrific, brutal, um, and, and an unspeakable, really, uh, conflict uh, where Russia just does more and more and more that is abhorrent uh, in the eyes of the rest of the world and um, horrific uh, to Ukraine and the Ukrainian citizens. Um, 
and that's a very, very harsh reality, needless to say, but again, I've tried to be honest with you and soldiers are not known for their diplomacy, but rather for their bluntness. And I'm afraid that is the reality that I see at this point in time. Uh, again, one can hope that there would be a dawning in Moscow that this is really a big, massive mistake and we need to figure out how it is that we get out of it. Maybe even you bring Henry Kissinger back to go with Chancellor Merkel and sit and listen to Putin and talk and so forth and try to, to, to come to some kind of agreement that could be acceptable to both Moscow and Kiev. But the truth is at this point in time, the objectives of each side and and the what what might be negotiated the this is so mutually exclusive um, as to be completely unworkable and to come back to uh, the very first question and the insertion of the word realistic um, this is just unrealistic as well with that, though, I, I probably do need uh, Timofei to um, to let you all go and get back to things, and, and I need to do likewise. And let me just say again how privileged I feel to have spent an hour with you uh, to do what normally people do. In fact, I teach tonight, Yale, of course, interestingly, on great power competition, uh, co-teach there. And this has been, needless to say, it has dominated all of our discussions every single week throughout this semester. Um, I mean, you know, you have to know how much Ukraine and, and its people are uh, on our minds and our hearts. Um, but we know that none of that, um, none of that uh, even gets to the heart of what it is that you all are experiencing, which is something that no human beings should have to experience ever. Uh, it makes even more admirable um, gathering like this to continue some sense of normalcy, even as your country uh, is, is being battered mercilessly by, by Russian forces. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so while uh, professor is disconnecting, I think uh, I can conclude with uh, some final uh, remarks um, to those who are still with us. Uh, Timothy, do you uh, want to leave? Yes. No, yeah, I'm going to go. I just want to apologize that we have been unable to ask questions like that. We'll record them and forward them to general and professor. And if he's willing to answer that, we'll post them. Okay. Yes, I was... It's a good point. Yes, yeah, sorry. So sorry to all uh, people who were not able to ask questions to uh, Professor directly. I will copy them now. Um, also, um, yeah, it, it, it's it's unfortunately that he has left because uh, you know several days ago we also had another guest, uh, Professor McFall, who had expressed an opposite opinion about uh, you know the matter of the sky so i think there is still a debate even among the american you know diplomats and politicians so i uh, i think there is still you know a room to to discuss this uh, but uh, please uh, keep uh, follow our events we will repeat these kind of events almost you know uh, every day uh, you can follow our twitter and facebook pages of kiev school of economics um, also our personal pages, Timofey Milovanov and Timofey Brick. And uh, I want to stress that we also have our own donation page. So Kyiv School of Economics has arranged uh, the special donation fund. You can send your support from the United States or from Europe. Uh, this donation is on our uh, web page. It's uh, on our Facebook. It's on our Twitter. And all the... Uh, all the support will go directly to humanitarian um, support of Ukrainians. So thank you very much for your time and for being here with us today. And I look forward to see you soon uh, discussing important matters with other top intellectuals. Uh, thank you. I will be coping the questions now, so I will stay here for maybe a minute, but everyone else is uh, free to disconnect. Thank you very much.
Bye. Bye-bye.